In 1974, the world prepared for what would turn out to be the most infamous fight of all time. Big George Foreman, the hardest hitter in boxing history, had taken the championship from Joe Frazier the year before in a decisive fashion. And the iconic Muhammad Ali had avenged his losses to Frazier and Norton in two tremendous clashes of skill and perseverance. Now there was only one fight the fans wanted to see, and they were going to get more than they ever expected. The two warriors soon jumped on a phone call to finalize the $10 million deal, split evenly down the middle. The fight was agreed to be held in Zaire, Africa, and billed as the rumble in the jungle. Ironically, the two confident gladiators both thought they heard fear and hesitation in the other's voice, surely ensuring an easy victory. But their iron wills and unshakable confidence were pretty much all the two had in common at that time. Each boxer could not have been more different in temperament or style. Foreman was a wrecking machine, an unstoppable Goliath who had raged through the heavyweight landscape. Laying waste with earth-shattering punches and thoroughly crushing all those foolish enough to stand before him. He boasted 40 fights and 40 victories, 37 of them by knockout. But it was not the bone-rattling concussive force of his blows alone that had won him those fisted conquests. Foreman had a refined jab and nuanced wrestling. Skills passed on to him from sparring the fearsome Sonny Liston. Rather than rely purely on sheer force to smash through his opponent's barricades, he used long guard tactics to prod and pull at their defenses. This had prompted Ali to christen Foreman the Big Mummy, but while Foreman had the same kind of relentless inevitability as a horror monster, he was anything but clumsy or uncoordinated. The Big Man had highly underrated head movement and footwork, and would even use subtle hand traps to remove his opponent's guard, a trick he had picked up years before from a judo practitioner. And this was the man that Ali had pissed off, less from any taunting or teasing, and more because many fans still saw Ali as the rightful champion. Muhammad Ali was perhaps the most graceful boxer to ever enter the ring, although he would surely give that honor to his hero, Sugar Ray Robinson. Ali had certainly adopted his idol's unorthodox footwork and whip-like jab. Breaking nearly every rule of boxing and reverse engineering it to fit his particular unique preferences, Ali would cross his feet, pull his head far behind his base of support, and slip far to his weak side. Despite all this, or maybe because of it, he had completely destroyed some of the most fearsome boxers of his era. But the question remained, what would happen if and when Foreman took away all of these tools? Ali was now 33, and his legs weren't what they once were. So what would happen when Ali was cornered and forced to contend with the fearsome haymakers of the young, strong, big George Foreman? The night arrived. It was 4 a.m. in Africa, the bout scheduled to air during primetime in the U.S. Despite this, the heat was sweltering, the fervent crowd only adding to it, the harsh lights sizzling and turning the arena bright as daylight. Foreman would be several minutes late to the ring. Before each fight, his trainer would wind him up with an emphatic stream of curses as he viciously described how Foreman would destroy his unlucky competitor. When he finally let Foreman loose, he felt like a monster that could explode his opponents with one punch. But this suited Ali fine, who now had time to get a feel for the ring, testing out the canvas and the ropes. And most importantly, familiarizing himself with the crowd, who he considered a vital partner in the ring, capable of asserting pressure and sending good vibrations. Big George arrived, ready to silence his detractors and claim the title he already owned. He had not let a fight go past three rounds in five years. He had trampled over Norton and Frazier, who Ali had struggled with. So why should tonight be any different? 
Already Ali was taunting him as they met to receive their instructions in the middle of the ring, saying, Chump, you're gonna get beat tonight. You never should have come to Africa. Your title is gone. The bell sounded. Instead of dancing, Ali charged forward to taunt Foreman, then leaped right back. But Foreman didn't take the bait, and Ali's swift would-be counters hit nothing but air. Foreman would stick to the plan his trainers had carefully devised for him. He methodically stalked the fleet-footed ex-champion. But all the power puncher got for his patient discipline was a lead right to the chin. Foreman's preference for crowding opponents at mid-range, combined with Ali's speed and tricky rhythm, made leading rights possible. But Foreman didn't mind, so long as he was closing the distance. He swung for the fences each time Ali got near the ropes. Ali controlled his head to imbalance him and throw his punches off course. As he so often did, Ali was flipping the script here, using grappling tactics against the man who had outmuscled many great champions to set up high impact KOs. Feeling that Foreman had been overhyped, Ali teased him, proclaiming that it was halfway through the round and he hadn't landed anything yet. But then, Foreman landed something. He nailed Ali to the ropes with his lead hand and hammered at his head and side. Ali pushed the stalwart heavyweight back with effort, but was trapped again only a moment later, Foreman pounding thudding haymakers into his sides. It was then that Ali first took a full impact shot from the formidable young champion. This punch George's camp referred to as the anywhere shot, because George would load it up from below his hip and just throw it as hard as he could not really caring where it landed. Ali was shaken. He fled the ropes and kept moving. But now Foreman had his rhythm down, and Ali was horrified to realize that he could not escape. Foreman was taking two steps to Ali's six, moving diagonally to cut off exit routes and expertly placing his left foot in between Ali's feet. Ali's only choices were to go toe to toe or retreat to a corner. Then, the bell sounded the end of the first round of the Rumble. As Ali walked back to his corner, he finally understood how Norton and Frazier had fallen with so little resistance. George Foreman was a monster. Ali knew he needed a new plan, but right then, he had no idea what it could possibly be. Ali tried to entice Foreman into committing again at the start of round two, but George one-upped him fainting to back Ali up without risking a real attack. He once more easily cornered Ali, but when he started pawing to destroy his guard, he found the ex-champion had no guard. Ali instead punched through and around Foreman's probing gloves, parrying and framing to create better positions. But after all that, it was a simple one-two that got the job done for Big George. This was the terror of George Foreman, Opponents never knew if his gloves were glue or dynamite from one moment to the next. Ali shelled up, focusing on survival, waiting for the tuning fork in his head to stop vibrating. He felt half awake and half in a dream, but he had been there before and was prepared. The awake part told the dream part, we must not get hit again. Fortunately for Ali, Foreman suddenly changed tactics whirling tremendous body hooks into his sides. Anyone who's seen footage of Foreman targeting the heavy bag has to wonder at Ali's insane conditioning to take those shots. Head cleared, Ali went back to hand fighting Foreman, relying on his superior speed to aim around the big man's arms, shouting at the fearsome champion as he unloaded. The second came to a close. The round had been as heated as any in heavyweight history, with both men scoring insane power blows. But there were few watching that would think Foreman wasn't getting the better of that deal. This time, Ali's opening trick almost worked, but Foreman parried his punch out of the way just in time. Ali had heard that the plan in the Foreman camp was to knock Ali out in three, and given the new fervor and urgency of Foreman's attacks, this very well may have been the case. Foreman was staying at a significantly longer range, rarely barreling in with wild punches. Ali couldn't control his head as well this way, 
and Foreman could better use the trapping tactics he was so fond of, clearing Ellie's guard to make way for his punch, sometimes with the very same hand. When Ellie tried to shell up, Foreman had a choice of targeting his body with wide looping shots or tearing down his guard by grabbing his forearm. And so, to Ali, the third felt like the longest round of his life. However, as his head began to clear and George began to slow, Ali came back to life, and he exclaimed and bragged with each shot, yelling, Where's your punch? Show me something. The ref repeatedly warned Ali to stay quiet, but everyone had said Foreman would kill Ali in three. The way he figured, if they expected him to stay quiet on the night of his death, they were sadly mistaken. The final ding may as well have been a funeral bell for George's ambitions. The fight would not be ending early. As George sat down, he felt as if he had already gone 15 full rounds, but there were 12 left to go. In round four, Ellie broke with his tradition and slowly retreated to the ropes, setting a steady pace only to break it with whiplashing jabs and crosses. Ali's punches stiffened the heavyweight giant repeatedly. Before he could react, Foreman found himself yanked off balance and smothered. Embraced by a man who shouted insults into his ear. But the greatest blow to Foreman this round did not come from his talkative opponent. At some point, Foreman looked into the crowd to see a man he had considered a close friend for years rooting for Ali. We'll never know who, as he refuses to remember his name, but it was all the young foreman could think of most of the fourth. Nonetheless, he managed an impressive piece of work near the end of the round, throwing a lead hook to the body, then changing angles to send another piercing straight through Ali's guard. But that was all to come of it. In between rounds, Ali's corner begged him to stay off the ropes. But Muhammad rarely listened to his corner. He felt he knew what he was doing. In Foreman's corner, his coaches spurred him forward, telling him to keep pouring it on. Foreman listened wholeheartedly, figuring it was his team's job to give advice and his job to take it. In round five, Foreman made an important adjustment, answering Ali's grappling with a cross frame or collar tie of his own. This way, the bigger man could trap Ali and pull him into his fearsome right hand. That was when Ali changed history in the most unexpected of ways. He took up a post on the ropes, leaned back, and shelled up. Foreman pounded hard shots into his midsection, and Ali dared him to hit him even harder. George didn't need to be asked twice. He hurled thunderous haymakers with all the fury of a god of war laying waste to a defiant nation. However, as with his footwork and head movement, Ali was using his high guard to showcase some of the most unconventional tactics ever seen in the ring. While the majority of boxers keep their arms in tight, moving them only slightly so as to create as few openings as possible, Ali was flaring out his elbows using a movement pattern similar to a karate upwards block to diffuse the massive power of Foreman's blows. While this would normally leave Ali too open to combinations, Foreman's loaded, looping roundhouses were too slow for him to take advantage. Ironically, this was similar to a tactic of the crossguard style used by Archie Moore, one of Ali's former teachers and a coach of Foreman for this very fight. The greatest would also shoot his arms out straight, leverage blocking to dispel the force of the blow. His only common tactic was to parry and block straight shots. For years, Ali had practiced taking his sparring partner's hardest shots in the gym while up against the ropes, much to the annoyance of his coach. Now, he felt he could judge how many punches any man could throw before getting tired. And more importantly, take the shots up to that point. Suddenly, with less than a minute left in the round, Ali came to life, smashing straights into Foreman's dome. Big George seemed completely unconcerned with Ali's power, walking through his shots to step out and angle in an uppercut. But a cutting jab snapped Foreman's head back, and as he ducked away, Ali chopped down on the Goliath's jaw, then used a jab to lance him forward, 
hurling a tremendous right just as George was trying to unleash his own uppercut. Foreman finally took a step back, gave a small nod of acknowledgement, then jumped right back in. Yet his head hadn't cleared, and Ali easily faded back from his unsteady attempts at a frame, unleashing his most powerful punch of the fight to turn Foreman's head clear around. Foreman never broke rhythm, as if Ali's punches were of absolutely no consequence. He finished by launching into a straight arm left hook. Muhammad used the lax ropes to lean back and lock up George's head, sticking his tongue out in sheer defiance of the most dangerous punch in boxing history. The bell announced the end of the round, and the crowd rose to their feet. What had looked to many like a one-sided massacre had suddenly changed into one of the most epic exchanges in boxing history, with Foreman getting the worst of it. However, it remained to be seen if Ali could somehow repeat this miraculous feat. So far, the two had thrown hundreds of punches, all in 90 degree weather with 90% humidity. But somehow, Foreman came steaming out of his corner at the start of round six. Ali met him there, crashing into him, pulling him close and yelling in his ear. In fact, in round six, Ali's one and only goal seemed to be to piss George Foreman off. The Louisville Lip taunted Foreman every chance he got. He would throw a few shots, tie Foreman up, shout into his ear, and then repeat the process all over again. It was a bizarre spectacle in a heavyweight championship bout. Few suspected there was a method to Ali's madness. In round seven, Ali actually walked himself to the ropes, to the bewilderment of many. But Foreman's shots seemed to be mere echoes of what they once were. Ali was able to slip away out the side when the slow champion tried to capture him in a corner. But even now, Foreman was dangerous. He managed to pull Ali into a tremendous uppercut, loaded up from below his knee. The shot may well have dropped Ali if Foreman had landed it back when he was fresh. Another blow connected nearly by accident, as a tired Foreman tripped over his own foot while throwing a punch. The unexpected rhythm took Ali by surprise, but Foreman's unsteady frame crashed through the ropes, leaving him unable to follow up. As the seventh neared its end, Ali clinched his nemesis tightly and made his feelings clear, saying, you got eight more rounds to go, eight more rounds, and look how tired you are. But in actuality, the uppercut had greatly troubled Ali. Back in his corner, he wondered to himself how much longer he could stand up under Foreman's relentless barrage. But in Ali's mind, no matter what the price was, be it a broken jaw, a smashed nose, he would gladly pay it to once again become king of the heavyweights. He figured you could play it careful only until you meet a man who will die before he lets you win. Then you have to lay it all on the line or back down and be damned forever. Ali could sense that test was about to come. The bell tolled, for who remained to be seen. Foreman's punches came wilder than ever. He seemed to leap into every lead hook. Ali pulled far back against the ropes, letting the punches sail by, terrifyingly close. The bee showed his stinger, small snaps that nonetheless bounced Foreman's head back. Still, Foreman chased, never easing up. Deep into the round, Foreman plunged forward and got stuck against the ropes. Ali cross-framed to send a looping right over his shoulder. Now Foreman was cornered, Ali angling out and sniping his jaw with short, tight rights. George tried to regain his poise, but Ali sensed the moment was here to risk it all. A long straight left hook thrown from underneath lifted Foreman's chin and Ali replaced it with one of the most powerful rights he had ever thrown. Big George's legs gave way, and he seemed to fall slow motion, Ali turning with him, fist cocked. But he didn't need to throw it. The heavyweight giant had fallen, sent tumbling to the canvas where he would just miss the count. Ali had shaken the world yet again. 
Foreman would forever believe he lost the bout due to treachery on behalf of one of his trainers. But he too would shake up the world when he regained the heavyweight title 20 years later. However, that's a story for another time. And speaking of stories, I am thrilled to announce the second part of our martial arts and combat sports comic, Mortal Weapons, is out as of right now. Part 1 was met with a lot of positivity, and after a very long delay due to the artist breaking his wrist while breaking through several bricks, not joking about that by the way, I can honestly say that this one is even better. It's a tribute to classic boxing movies and manga, along with old school kung fu and samurai movies. Mortal Weapons 2 continues the story of a samurai who travels to England to conquer the world of London prize fighting. If you haven't had a chance to check out the first, both are now available in a two-part collection. If you've ever enjoyed our videos, you will enjoy the hell out of this comic. It's tactical, it's a lot of pure entertaining fun, it's our passion project and the thing I am most proud of creating. Ebook and paperback are linked below. I know you'll enjoy. Thank you so much for watching and giving me the opportunity to make things like this comic and this video. Happy training.